Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, Simon Honigman. Um, it's very exciting to, to be here today, the culmination of, of a lot of work and planning and seeing old friends and meeting new ones and making new collaborations. Um, thanks, Nicole and David for in your introductions. Um, before we start, I think it's probably best to, to focus in on lived experience. And um, we sadly don't have a speaker in person today able to, to share lived experience, but we have from the Perinatal Mental Health Project, the project that I'm a part of in Cape Town, which has been running for 22 years, and I'll speak a bit about it later today. We have one of our, our, our previous clients sharing a little bit of her story um, today. She's given full permission. Her name is Carol. Um, she didn't want her surname shared, but she's given full permission for, for this um, to be presented and to, to be shared for advocacy purposes. So let's go straight into to hearing a little bit about her story. I think it's opening. There we go. It just takes a while. Uh, it's not the screen. It's really hard. It's um, I mean, sometimes um, I've. <laughs> feel I can explode because I'm. I'm alone, I'm over in maternity while I was pregnant. And um, then we, uh, one of the sisters approached me and she asked me um, to complete a form. I didn't know what it was about. And then um, after completing the form and answering all the questions, they, they scored my points. And then they told me that I needed to see a counselor. Yeah, I, when I was, I, I I was always the person that uh, tell myself when I just like that. Yeah, I'm just it is very hard. It's um, I mean sometimes um, I feel I can explode because I'm I'm alone. I'm over in maternity while I was pregnant, and um, then we uh, one of the sisters approached me and she asked me. Um, to complete a form. I didn't know what it was about. And then um, after completing the form and answering all the questions, they, they scored my points. And then they told me that I needed to see a counselor. Yeah, I, when I was, I, I, I was always the person that uh, told myself when I was younger, um, I want to get married. <coughs> and uh, you know buy a house yeah. and then start a family yeah. but then i got involved with the wrong guy and um, i felt pregnant before i got married mm -hmm. and um, when i told the guy that um, i was pregnant he actually denied it was his child and just took off i never saw him again why me why does it have to happen to me but then i just thought you know it happens to a lot of people you know a lot of women the day i told him that was over the phone actually and i never saw him again he never saw me pregnant he never saw the baby thinking of um why did i get involved with him how could i be so stupid you know it's actually i punish myself a lot pull up the question there um, there was like questions. I normally, when it comes to, to your feelings, I normally just, you know, where it says, um, how do you feel? If it's good or bad, I would just be good. But somehow, maybe I was reaching out for help. That's why I said yes. Because normally I, w I would just say no. Because I'm not one who talks about my feelings. Mm -hmm. But I agreed and I said, yes, you can make the appointment. Mm -hmm. I'll see the counsellor. Because, um, I, like I told you, I'm the sort of friend that no one sees my, you know, my sensitive side or <coughs> no one knows what I, I was going through. So I didn't want them to know, you know. And um, talking to someone I didn't know was actually a good thing because I knew 
No one would look at me. She wouldn't look at me because she doesn't see me on a daily basis. I felt much better that it was someone that I didn't know. Being all those hurt feelings inside, you know, um, it's not a good thing. Because it just made me an unhappy person. And I, would, I didn't want to be an unhappy mother, actually. And then I just thought to myself, um, when I talked to Bronwyn, I don't know how, but it, I felt much better. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to be convening the first session today on, on moving to scale. Um, it's a little bit unlike the other sessions in that we start with our keynote uh, um, by the World Health Organization. Um, it's going to be a film with several collaborators um, discussing their work. But just to set the scene about what does it mean to move to scale, all of us in this room and online, welcome. We know that poor maternal mental health is a significant public health problem, and more broadly, a crisis for human development worldwide. Those of us working on the continent, as Nicole has mentioned, are aware of the unique socioeconomic cultural and healthcare systems challenges that make the scaling of services for perinatal women so difficult. Um, we will hear today about the extremely high prevalence on the continent. Um, as mentioned, at least one in five women will have a common mental disorder, mm -hmm. depression and or anxiety during this period from conception through to the first year postpartum. Um, and despite this high prevalence, I mean, there are very few health conditions that have such a high prevalence. Despite this high prevalence and the proven human and financial cost, and the proven human and financial costs intergenerationally, these conditions are for the most part undetected and untreated. Yeah. Can everyone mute? If you're not speaking. Okay. So what are these key health challenges for scaling? Um, well, we have the health systems challenges and I'm hoping we'll discuss that a bit today at the systems level. Uh, many African countries face significant health care infrastructure and systems limitations, in particular for rural areas where a large portion of the population resides. There's often a lack of adequate healthcare facilities and trained professionals to provide mental health services. So what are the economic constraints here? Well, in addition to limited funding and resources allocated to health in general, these seem to be disproportionately lowly allocated to mental health, um, with mental health budgets often being less than five or even 1% of health budgets on most, in most countries on the continent. Um, their, their mental health care and maternal mental health care competes with other pressing health issues, infectious diseases, HIV, um, and increasingly other non-communicable diseases and chronic diseases. So there's, an, there's a competition for attention and funding. Uh, there, there are issues with training and workforce uh, with an enormous shortage of mental health professionals, including psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists, trained counselors. But in addition to this, the existing health workforce, primary health care workers, are often lacking in training in basic mental health care issues, and they themselves may be experiencing unmanaged mental health challenges. And then we have on top of this, this, this contextual problem of of obstetric violence or disrespect and abuse, which seems to be ubiquitous um, globally and po possibly particularly bad on the African continent. We're faced with stigma and cultural um, barriers. Um, these uh, remain significant um, issues on, on, on the continent. However, we need to embrace situations where cultural, um, cultural practices may be in fact um, affirming and, and therapeutic and supportive of women. 
Um, but certainly stigma and some cultural issues can hinder access for women. We need to also look systemically at gender inequity. This shapes women's access to care and the quality of care that they receive. Women face barriers due to societal norms that stigmatize mental health issues and prioritize physical health over mental well-being. And in addition, gender inequities in education and employment can limit, limit women's financial independence, making it harder for them to seek and afford mental health services or any health services. And disproportionate care responsibilities and gender-based violence further exacerbate mental health conditions and are usually not addressed within health service delivery platforms. They siloed out of the health service platform. So we'll be speaking a bit more later about these social determinants, but I think they're, they're critical to appreciate when we're looking at scale. Several interventions have been tested in pilot projects, they've been implemented in NGOs, or even fully evaluated in beautiful, robust, randomized control trials and other trials. However, there's a, there, wherever there's an attempt, though, to expand coverage of these services, or whether, whether, where these interventions are adopted in other contexts, there's oftentimes what we call a voltage drop. Can I just have a show of hands from people in the room? Do you do people know what that, who knows what that concept means, voltage drop, okay? This, this is where the effectiveness of that intervention that was shown in the pilot, in the, in, the, in the research project, in the NGO, that effectiveness gets diluted with scale, with the complexity of scaling. Uh, so in the real world situation, um, in broader settings, um, there's, there's a lack of fidelity and there's a drop in effectiveness to the original concept. And we really need to pay attention to that and think about how we can mitigate against this. So what can we do to scale mental health services and what can we do to scale them well? Today, we'll hear now from our WHO colleagues <laughs> about, um, and others in several diverse contexts um, who have worked to scale services or examine what does and doesn't work. And we hope that they will share with us the richness of their experience, the complexity of their experience. And if they only speak about what works well, we, we must be sure to interrogate, because this is where we learn what did not work. So that's our responsibility. Thank you very much. I'm going to go straight into the WHO presentation. Hello, and thank you so much for inviting us to speak about the importance of integrating perinatal mental health into maternal and child health services. This is currently a priority area at the WHO, and we have been working with countries to support implementation efforts. We will be sharing our experiences with you today, but first, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague Julius Muron from the WHO Regional Office. Julius will be giving us an overview of the impact and current perinatal mental health provision in the Africa region. Over to you, Julius. Pregnancy and childbirth is um, a period of happiness uh, for the family. The reality, though, is uh, one in five women will experience uh, some form of mental health condition. A majority of those cases will be mild to moderate, uh, depression, anxiety, and mild forms of psychological trauma. The conditions impair functions of the mother. And as we know, especially in our context, mothers take care of the whole family. And when they are not able to do that, then the whole family is really severely impacted. We know that there are some risk factors that increase the risk of mothers developing these conditions. Definitely, uh, pregnancy and childbirth increase the burden on, on the economic resources that are available in the family. And this increases the risk of uh, developing this condition. But also uh, within our societies, there are changes in the social support system. We know before uh, a woman who is pregnant, who has given birth, receives support uh, from other family members. But because of migration and urbanization, the family setting is becoming small. So the women have to continue executing their function of taking care of uh, 
the family, which is really a huge task even during that period. Also, we know that women who have pre-existing uh, physical health conditions such as HIV or those who have complicated pregnancy and complicated childbirth have a higher risk. It's also known that um, adolescent mothers have unique challenges that they have to deal with, and this also increases the risk of them developing these conditions. This is made worse by uh, the fact that health services are not easily accessible, especially in rural areas, but in particular, mental health services are not uh, available in most communities. A number of um, studies have shown us that uh, services to promote mental well-being of the mothers, as well as address uh, psychosocial stressors, are very effective. For example, when lay people are trained to deliver psychoeducation to mothers and to train them on parenting skills, it improves outcomes in pregnancy, but also well-being of their newborn children including improving um, uh, attachment or bonding between the mother and her child. Thank you, Julius. Um, WHO has been uh, developing a range of products which are available for supporting country integration of perinatal mental health into maternal and child health services. You see some of those in the slide here. In terms of guidelines, there are recommendations for uh, psychosocial interventions for uh, anxiety and depression in the perinatal period in WHO's early child development guidelines. There are recommendations for screening as well as prevention interventions for depression and anxiety in the perinatal period in the postnatal care guidelines. And WHO's MH GAP guidelines have a range of recommendations for non-specialists to be able to deliver care for, for mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. Then we have the planning guidance, which is the how to integrate mental health into maternal and child health services. I'll be speaking about this guide a little more in detail. And to accompany the guide, there are manuals, such as the Thinking Healthy Manual for delivery of psychological interventions by lay health workers to women with perinatal depression as well as job aids such as the algorithms within the MHCAP intervention guide for non-specialists to be able to assess and treat a range of mental health conditions. This guide for integration of perinatal mental health will serve program managers, health service administrators, as well as policy makers, all those who are responsible for the planning and managing of services for women and infants during the perinatal period, the guide aims to develop and sustain an evidence-informed approach to planning uh, mental health services within MCH services. What the guide does is it provides detailed step-by-step -step guidance, along with practical tools to address different dimensions, such as policies, planning, training, supervision, financial management, and most importantly, monitoring and evaluation of programs. Over the last year, we have been working in countries to develop integrated care pathways and adapting this guidance to suit specific contexts. I am delighted now, in fact, to pass the floor to colleagues from Kenya, Mozambique and Tanzania to share their experiences. First, I would like to welcome um, reflections from Dr. Catherine Wanjiku. She is a lead in maternal mental health at the Division of Mental Health in the Ministry of Health in Kenya. Over to you, Dr. Wanjiku. So today I would like to actually, as just as nature has said, I would like to explain what we are doing as a country in, when it comes to maternal mental health. And um, currently what is available for us to support the peri mental health in the country is we have policy documents on uh, that support on the maternal mental health. One of the policy documents we have is the Kenya Mental Health Action Plan, which puts emphasis on the need to actually integrate mental health in special in among the vulnerable group, and it still insists on the preventive and promotive um, uh, promotion of the maternal mental health. That we have people on the ground that are actually creating awareness on the guidelines that we have come up with on the maternal mental health. And if need, we also paid attention to the pregnant teen team. 
On uh, what has been, as I said, what we have been able to do to support the integration of the mental, mental health, we've been creating awareness and dissemination of the current policy documents, as I've said. We've also been integrating maternal mental health into the existing uh, MCH clinic. Of note, our biggest maternity hospital, which is called Pumwani, which is the largest obstetric facility, has a maternal dedicated maternal health unit within the facility. So it's there to offer the specialized, to cater for their mental health, if need be. Uh, in terms of our healthcare, we've been trying to uh, do capacity building, especially with the workers that are working in the ANC and MCH clinics. And we plan to have a maternal health technical working group that will be accountable for fostering collaboration among the various stakeholders involved in the integration of mental health into the perinatal health services. And that te uh, technical working group will also be in charge of minimizing obstacles uh, in terms of its work. And of note is that the TWG will be able to maintain the group focus. When you have that focus, it will actually help uh, with the uh, agenda and the outcome and also the benefits. So far, the lessons that we have learned as we are trying to integrate um, mental health into the maternal space is um, there's the great importance of having a technical working group being uh, the reason being that mental and maternal health has not been given that much attention as it should be so there's a big gap then integration of this uh mental maternal mental health requires it's not that going to be a responsibility of just one sector it requires a multi-sectoral approach and it's very important to have a plan so we have learned that by having a, a good plan it's going to effectively enable us to be able to integrate and having a plan is not just enough. How to sustain that uh, mental health programs, it requires a collaboration of various stakeholders, as we said, and from different departments and areas. And uh, more so dealing with the challenges or with stigma, it's still a big issue associated with the mental illness, and um, we are trying to make strides on it. Thank you so much, Dr. Wanjiku. Now we'll hear about the experience in Mozambique from my colleague Alicia Carbonell at the WHO country office. In Mozambique, the experience, we, we started uh, with a pilot in, uh, in screening maternal uh, depression in the postpartum services. We started in 2018. With this all component, we oh, the, the, was developed a training package as they are for um, screening and management the the the, the postpartum uh, maternal depression and uh with the support from WHO, show what uh, what we decided to move forward and to uh to do the the training in different uh regions just to have a pilot to really understand how this we how we can we can uh improve the the integration of the maternal uh, mental health. We trained 40 um, health providers that included uh, maternal and child health nurses, um, uh, mental health providers, psychologists, and uh, this uh, uh, created a team to uh, start a screening. And what is we are planning is uh, to, to document to follow what what is being done in these uh, health facilities uh, regarding to the the, the screening uh, and the or the management of the maternal depression. When we when discussing the the issue, what we learned from the the implementation, one thing that was uh, the so, sometimes the nurses that are. In, 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 in this, uh, the preventive services, ANC, uh, postnatal care, child health uh, consultation, they are so very um, busy. So they need to more uh, um, mentorship, to more uh, as a follow up uh, visit to, for those uh, um, uh, professionals that were trained in this um, maternal mental health. And uh, of course, one a, a, a big lesson learned is definitely uh, um, the the program uh, maternal health program cannot work uh, alone. 
should be integrated in maternal and child health services. I'd like to now uh, uh, invite uh, Dr. Erasmus Mendeme from the Ministry of Health in Tanzania. I can start it by acknowledging that you have got a, 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 a mental health program that integrates mental health services into RSCH. And the program started on May 2023. And this is started by having a, work, a workshop, a planning workshop that was organized by the Ministry of Health and this was conducted in Dar es Salaam. And through that planning workshop, we managed to have a planned activities, about seven to nine planning activities that I'm going to take you through. We had got activity number one that he, that he, we needed to start by uh, doing situational analysis and need assessment. And second planned activity from the workshop is stakeholder engagement and the third planned activity is to train healthcare providers and the launching of the program um, here needed to be ceremonial meaning that we needed to invite the policymakers community leaders as a way of starting the uh, public campaign to tell them tell the people that you have now the program that we need the people the pregnant mother to to, to attend we have got a 30 planned active 40 planned activities and this is going to tie well after we have piloted the program and this is all about the public awareness campaign and the 50 pro uh, planned activities is the policy document planned activities is to adapt all the perinatal mental health activities to, to suit the pregnant mothers with a disability we are then planned activities number seven is to design a framework and formulate a perinatal mental health activity indicator and this will be valuable as we pilot it that is going to monitor the activity and then we'll be able to tell the impact of this program over time and the last planned activity is to ensure adequate allocation of the resources but we also have got a training and the training uh, program. And this is the effort for the government of Tanzania that we keep on training professionals, not only at the higher end hospitals, but also at the primary level. And even currently um, here at Bagamoyo, we are preparing curriculum for psychology, the medical psychology that is uh, going to produce a, a one important a professional cadre that will provide in counseling and the psychotherapy with the lesson that he, uh, we learned so far is the advantage of engaging stakeholders from the start and we find a very valuable insight from stakeholders they have provided a, a technical work in a, arranging in a framework of activity planning to the program that is running but also financial support this is where we are in Tanzania. We hope for good that the program is going to operate nicely and upon be able to implement all the activities, then we're going to have a very huge uh, experience and success to share. Thank you for that. And I beg you to stop here. Thank you so much, Dr. Mack. Thank you for uh, drawing to our attention and reminding us the importance of all stakeholders working together if we want to do this effectively. Quite a lot is being done across all the three countries, and now we are, in fact, excited to see how this continues to progress. Through this process, we will also continue to refine available implementation materials, such as training guides, screening tools, templates, for example, for monitoring and evaluation which will then accompany the existing guide for integration and also to support uh, not only the countries the, that uh, are already engaged, but also then other countries in the region for improving outcomes for women as well as children and the families. Thank you very much for listening um, and look forward to the discussion. Um, thank you very much. Um...
we will now, I will now be introducing um, Dr. Bibilolo Oladeji, our first speaker. Um, Dr. Oladeji, are you online and ready to share your presentation? Uh, while, while we, I see her. Yes, yes. I will just thank you. Welcome, Bibi, a friend of ours from Nigeria. I'll just introduce Bibi very briefly. Um, as, as mentioned, the bios of all the speakers, and I didn't get, have a chance to, to um, I didn't have a chance to, to introduce all the WHO speakers, um, but the, the bios will be fully and um, published in the e-booklet. Dr. Oladeji is a senior lecturer um, from the College of Medicine at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. She's a consultant psychiatrist and has close to two decades of research and clinical experience in adult psychiatry, currently heading the general adult and maternal mental health unit. In the context of her research and clinical work, she provides mentorship to psychi psychiatry trainees and junior faculty and, tra and has trained hundreds and hundreds of frontline non-specialist healthcare providers to identify and provide evidence-based care for common mental disorders in primary and secondary care. Bibi, if you could go ahead and sh uh, and and start your your um, presentation, and then we'll um, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, that kind introduction and um, this opportunity to share our work. I'll be presenting on behalf of my colleagues at the WHO Collaborating Center for Research and Training in Mental Health, Neurosciences and Substance Abuse at the University of Ibadan. So because of the short time, I'll just be providing an outline of our work and the factors that um, enabled our research project to, to transition to um, building a foundation and a structure that can enable the larger scale practice for integrating mental health into the maternal and child health care. So I'll provide the context and then speak about the um, initiative under which our project was funded, provided just a very brief outline of the project and the fallout. And I'll also speak briefly about the challenges and the lessons we have learned in the context of implementing this. So just to start by looking at the resources available for mental health care in Nigeria, our current population is estimated at above 200 million. Um, Nigeria, that's highlighted in red, is situated in West Africa. And um, we have about 35 doctors to a pop serving a population of 100,000, 86 nurses and midwives to a population of 100,000. For psychiatrists, we have about um, one psychiatrist serving a, and, um, a population of a half a million. And we know that all these providers, the more specialized providers, are more likely to practice in the secondary and tertiary facilities that are located in urban centers, which means for a larger population of um, our population that resides in the urban, um, in the rural areas, just like um, Dr. Honigman pointed out earlier, I'm less likely to have care facilities available to them. The workforce that is available in the primary health care in Nigeria, non-physician community health workers, they're the most prevalent. We have a few physicians and nurse midwives working in that context. And for the community health workers, we have about 136 serving a population of 100,000. So, sorry, just to go back to this slide, we work in Oyo State, that's where the capital is in Ibadan, and that is highlighted in purple on the map of Nigeria shown below. So we know that 50% um, of evidence-based practices that um, are discovered in research let, uh, are implemented in real world clinical settings. And it actually takes about 17 years for such evidence to translate to practice. One of the main barriers to this is that the traditional method is for researchers to generate the evidence and then to try to transfer that downstream to frontline implementers. And as many of us know, such um, um, evidence generated from research actually difficult to to translate at scale at the in real world settings. So this is one of the problems associated with generating evidence from research and then trying to translate that into practice. So recently, there have been more calls for 
um, involving implementers and policymakers right from inception in designing the project. And I guess this is one of the things that um, informed this initiative funded by three Canadian agencies, the Innovating for Maternal and Child Health Care in Africa Initiative. This initiative was, um, this initiative actually funded 20 project implementation projects across different 11 countries in West and East Africa. The countries are highlighted in this map. And the goal of this initiative was to fund implementation projects that were aimed at improving maternal, newborn, and child health outcomes by strengthening health system. Our project was the only one in West Africa that was funded and, and, and worked on um, mental health in mothers. So, that, so what happened was that the, in addition to funding the implementation research teams, they also funded what they described as health policy and research organizations, HPRO, one in East Africa and one in West Africa to kind of coordinate the activities of the research teams and also work with policymakers so that whatever evidence is generated can be used at the national level. And they also the HPROs were also started with the responsibility of strengthening the capacity for implementation research and also strengthening the capacity of policymakers to make use of evidence generated from research into formulating policy and building the health system. So we had two projects funded, but I'll only speak about our main project, which is the scaling up care for prenatal depression for improved maternal and infant health. So the impl our implementation study was designed to study the facilitators and barriers for integrating care for prenatal depression in primary health care using the available human resources that I described earlier, which are the community health workers. And we adopted a task sharing approach and because we realized that looking at the number of psychiatrists we have in Nigeria, it might be difficult for us to have the psychiatrists actually train all the um, frontline community health workers. So we supported, we used, adopted a train the trainer approach in which psychiatrists trained the more senior primary care providers, which include the physicians, the more senior um, nurse midwives working in the primary health care setting, and the senior community health officers. So we selected them from across the um, local governments where we worked. And we trained them to provide training to other frontline providers. And also, they were also trained to provide supportive supervision. So this, the frontline providers were trained to identify prenatal depression. And they were also trained to use um, psychosocial interventions based on the image gap implementation guide to provide evidence-based interventions for them. And we know that Without refresher training and supportive supervision, it will be it, it's it's going to be difficult to have it in um, success with that sharing approach. So we also had refresher training in the course of the program, and then supportive supervision provided by their trainers. So for us, um, okay, I, I I didn't describe this earlier. One of the key things that the innovation, the um innovation sponsored by this Canadian organization, did was for each team to have three principal investigators. And one of the principal investigators must be an identified policymaker that is most relevant to the research in the context in which you were working. So for us in Oyo states where we're working in Ibadan, the policymaker PI that was identified was the executive director for the State Primary Healthcare Development Agency. This policymaker is a senior top level government official, he heads the government agency that is in charge of the primary health care in the state. So he had oversight for primary health care um, services in the state. So this principal investigator was incorporated into the research right from this onset because we had to name him as our PI, as part, um, as part of um, the pro procedure for getting the funding. And he was involved right from the design. So we worked with him to design the project. We worked with him to, to design the implementation in terms of the training, how to go about the training, the selection of um, the work, um, senior workers that were trained, and then also the frontline workers. And he was present at some, of, at some of the trainings. He also attended every research team meeting. And then we had annual investigators meeting. And the policy organizations were also funded to have national 
meetings, bringing together all the research teams, because in Nigeria, it was not just us. We had other research teams funded from other areas of parts of Nigeria to an annual conference where we had policymakers and the research teams um, at, the, at the meeting. So the fallout of this program, which, well, it wasn't really from, um, um, from it wasn't really part of what the scope of the project actually covered, but because of the increased awareness from the policymaker, he went ahead after the life of our project to appoint one of the senior health workers, senior community health workers, who is a nurse midwife, to coordinate the mental health care within the primary health care development agency. So he starts to do this senior primary health care worker with the um, responsibility of building integration of primary health into mental health into the primary health care across all the local governments in the state. So what the um, this coordinator has done is to select another senior primary, a senior primary health care worker across all the local governments in the state. And um, this has the um, impact of actually having these step down trainings to every community health worker in the state, even though for now, what we've done, we've supported the team to train, have initial training for all these selected um, focal persons as they, they are described for, for uh, mental health in all the local governments. And we worked with them to develop Baby, like a sorry. working collaboration. Yes, please. Sorry, sorry, Baby. We just have one more minute. Thank you. Yes, I just have a slide left. So I'm rounding up. Thank so you. we developed collaboration at the referral system and we're developing work and work plan. So we are in the process where now we need to train all the other primary health care workers to step down the training. So the challenges and the lesson learned. The lesson that we have learned is that while it's important to fit project in, um, implementation to the context in which we're going to be using it, so we there must be adaptations to fit that context so that there can be the project can be successful. And the places where you have an existing policy, it provides an enabling setting for the program to work. In Nigeria, we have a national mental health policy that actually supports integration of mental health care. So that was a key enabler. And then if there's ownership of the program, which is what happened with having that policy maker PI, it enables translation of research to practice. One of the key challenges we have faced is that of funding and the human resource shortages, which is um currently increasing with this massive drift of people from um, trained healthcare providers from low and middle income countries to high income countries. So these are some of the references and publications from our project. And I would like to appreciate everyone and acknowledge our funders. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much, uh, Professor Oladeji. Um, we are, before we go on to our other speakers, we thought we'd have a break now for some Q&A and discussion um, regarding the WHO keynote presentation, as well as um, Professor Oladeji's talk. Um, do we have any... Yeah, we, we have um, apologies, but it seems like people may not be able to chat directly, and we're trying to fix that. Could... Um, yeah, well, the problem is people can't be found. Like, if people could maybe raise their hand if they can't access or write anything in the chat, if they have no, uh, okay, because we've, we've tried to activate it, but it didn't seem to work. Maybe we can, um, we're just trying to do that. If you communicate with the people um, through the chat on that, and in the meantime, if there are any audience, why well, yeah. you trying to sort that out? Just to let, yeah, we're, yeah. we're working on it. Okay, um, sorry about that. Sorry about that for the online people. Um, uh, baby, if you could just share your your camera, that would be great. Um, and if any of the WHO team could also share their cameras. Um, we've got, we've got a question. Can we take any questions from the audience in the meantime? Thank you. Um, I see. Um, but but I, I just want to apologize for getting a little bit mixed up before you go ahead. 
Um, I did not introduce um, the WHO team, and um, I think we have um, welcome Nerja. I think I see you there. Are any of your colleagues joining us today um, in person? Yeah, um, in, in on online, you mean? Yes, there is. Yes. Uh, there's Tatiana there, who's been a part of the uh, team. There is also Alicia Carbonell, who's um, uh, Who's in the in the uh, in the room? There is um, uh, Chido from our regional office, as well as Julius from the regional office. Um, okay. There is Makeba from the Kenya office. Um, I think that's it. I don't know if uh, okay. anyone else has been able to stay on. <clears throat> okay. Well, well, thank you very much. So just to. Perhaps what I'll do is introduce um, Dr. Chowdhury um, and the other um, the other WHO team members can briefly introduce themselves if they're going to be answering any questions or asking any questions. Um, Dr. Chowdhury is a technical officer in the Department of Mental Health, Brain Health and Substance Use at World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. Um, she's a psychiatrist by training and works in the brain health team. Her role includes the development of normative tools and guidance to support the integration of mental, neurological and substance use conditions. Um, for example, she's led the development of resources linked to WHO's MHGAP program and as the focal point for perinatal mental health, working closely with colleagues across WHO departments at headquarters, regional and country offices. Um, and we are very, very grateful and delighted that you have provided us such a, a beautiful resource in that film and, and being, being with us today to, to, to be part of the conversation. So we have one, we have a, we have a, a, a question from the audience. If you're wanting to direct it to anybody in particular, please go ahead. And we can we can start having um, about 10, 15 minutes of conversation at this stage. Thanks. Thank you. So this is more of a comment, I guess, than a question. It's just I um could you just introduce yourself? Hi, please? sorry, uh, my name is Gracia Felmuth. I'm a researcher um based here in Oxford in the population health department, and my research is on women's mental health, but mainly in the Asian context. Um but I was really interested in your talk, Dr. Bibi, and thought that was an amazing model of your uh, research where you had the policymaker as one of the PIs, which I think is brilliant. And I think I just wanted to say that from a researcher perspective, I think one of the real frustrations is the difficulties that we have in working together with policymakers. And one of the barriers, I think, to doing that is a lot of the funding, research funding doesn't facilitate that kind of collaborating with policymakers. And so I just wondered if you have any, um, I mean, I, I think it's it's an amazing model that you spoke about and um, wondered if you had any thoughts how funding, research funding in general could be more um, accommodating those kinds of relationships. I just, I don't know if it's a UK specific, UK funder specific issue, but it just feels very difficult to kind of um, be successful in funding bids that bring together policymakers and researchers. Thank you, Bibi. If you want to respond to that, thank you for thank you. Um, for that question and the opportunity to um, speak about this. I think it's it's a common thing. Usually, research funding does not actually cover um, policy makers and um, involving policy makers in the research. But the INCHA initiative funded by these three Canadian government agencies actually specified that they wanted policy makers as part of the research. Not just that, they also funded organization, the WAHO, to support policy makers. And, you know, because the WAHO that was funded in that project had that capacity to be able to relate directly with the policymakers, even at the federal government level. It made it easy to have policymakers at every other level involved with the research. So it's just a specific funding with that. 
And one thing that we learned it was, it's very interesting working with policymakers. It's totally different from when you are working with just your research team. So we learned, I learned a lot from working in that research. The workings of, you know, policymaking is totally different from how we run in the universities. And, and it, it was a very interesting experience with getting the policymakers involved. So it's, it was just a, a specific funding. And I think it's something that other funders need to co borrow from because it actually facilitated moving things forward. So it's not a common thing to have funders pay for policymakers or have policymakers involved, but we found that an interesting way to get to move from research to practice, which was what the funders did in um, implementing this particular initiative. Thank you very much. I think I think I mean perhaps in some of the breaks we can speak about how we can we can address the sort of different cultures that policymakers work in and researchers work in and, and, and think of ways to, to have intercultural, <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost a different context and to think of transcultural collaboration across these different frameworks. Um, are we ready for an online question or the, or thank you? Yes, um, we had a question, uh... Yes, um, for various um, people. No, 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 thank you. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Ashley, could you unmute the people? Um, we had Devjit Sen from Path. Sorry, because I can't see the function. Uh, if Devjit, um, if we could unmute Devjit. Um, okay, I'll, I'll have it allowed to talk. Devjit, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Or you are muted, Pat. Oops. Hi, can folks hear me? That's yeah. great. If we could see you as well, that would be brilliant. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Cool. So uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity to attend. And my question was for the presenter from Nigeria. So I was just wondering if um, you could tell us a little bit more about how the tools um, were adapted. like. Did you create any job aids, any supportive supervision checklists um, that to, to support um, certain delivery of uh, maternal mental health services? And what does the referral pathway look like? So for example, if um, a woman is diagnosed with suspected uh, maternal depression, who does she get referred to? Um, what sort of support does she receive? And is there any sort of community support like your support groups um, that she can access um, after the diagnosis? Thanks and over. Um, uh, maybe if you could answer um, Dibjet's question. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, let me, I want to also take that. There's another question in the chat that is related to this that I think I should just take together that says that are all the trained staff remunerated for the, or the work as volunteers and what was your experience after the MHGAP training if all the trained staff actually implemented the approach? So taking both um, together, for in terms of the tools, we use the MHGAP implementation guide and this was already adapted to the Nigerian context. So we use that um, to, for the training. And the MHGAP also had has other tools, which include a supportive supervision checklist. So it was one of the things that we used. And what we tried to do was um, we, we didn't want to um, disrupt the usual structure of the primary health care system, which was one of the advantages of having um, the executive director of the state primary health care board as part of our research team. So the usual thing is that women that come in for antenatal care are seen by the primary health care workers. And um, when the women need further care, there is usually a physician in the context where we work. There's one physician in each local government, that's the medical officer of health or the primary health care coordinator for that local government who has the oversight for seeing, um, supporting the primary health care workers. So usually this and uh, more senior the doctor who is usually a physician or um, a, um, a senior nurse midwives usually work in one of the clinics. And the first referral point is usually this person and then the specialist care. So what we did was um, to have to train the physicians that are working in the system 
So when there are difficult cases, we found out that for the most part, from the earlier studies that we have done, because we have, we actually had done before this implementation research, we had actually done um um a, a clinical trial, and we found that only few women would need more um, treatment um, beyond the psychosocial interventions that the primary healthcare workers can be trained to carry out. So the first point of call are the community health workers. So they were trained to use, do carry out psychosocial interventions. And you mentioned about screening. We also implemented for some of the clinics so that we know what can support their ability to identify. We use the two item patient health questionnaire to screen. So for patients that screen positive, answer yes to add either of the two questions on the PHQ-2. The community health workers had to then um, carry out further interviews using the MHGAP because that was what we trained them to use to make diagnosis, to see who qualified for a diagnosis or not. So we basically used the MHGAP and then to now decide when to train. And then there's another question about um, the time in primary health care clinic. We know that... Carrying out psychosocial interventions is time consuming. And we, we didn't want to introduce a new set of um, care providers. We wanted to use what was available because we didn't want to. And then we also did not remunerate them specially for this because mental health is actually part of the core, um, core areas that primary health care is supposed to take care of. So we made it, we made it to look to um become part of their routine services. So what we encourage them to do is to fix time. There are days when they're not busy. So to fix time for sexual interventions outside of those busy hours of the clinic so that they can have more time to spend with the women. So sometimes maybe after the antenatal clinic, that's when the women that need sexual interventions will come. On days when the clinic is not that busy, they have days when they're not running immunization or running antenatal visits. So that was what we tried to do in making the work to be done by the available providers. So the referral pathway is from the community health officers to the physician that is working with them at the local government level. And then when there's a need for specialist care, they are able to, they, they have access to refer to us at the specialist level. So we tried not to bring in a new set of practitioners into the system. Thank you. Um, thank you, Debbie, for answering two, two really important questions together. We have a question from Laura in the audience. Um, thank you, Laura. We're gonna ask you to, to speak quite loudly because of the AV issues. Thanks. Hello. There we go. Um, so I'm Laura Asher from the University of Nottingham. So it's a question, um, a kind of follow-on question for Professor Oledeji. Um, so thank you for giving a really nice example, as has been mentioned, about the really meaningful involvement of uh, policymakers in that in that PE or PI role. Um, so my question is kind of about the, the reality and the practicalities of that. Like, did, did they really have time? Or did they have capacity to kind of... Um, to contribute to the project in the way that you hoped? And if there were any issues, how did you kind of, what did you do to overcome that? Thanks. Uh, Bibi, thank you. Um, thank you. I guess one of the things that we had going for us was that the executive director then was part of the people that we had trained in, uh, in the earlier clinical trial. So was already involved with doing um seeing maternal mental health and overseeing community health workers in the local government where he was working then as um the physician and you know taking referrals from them and supporting them in this work. So because I guess because of that, you already had um quite some knowledge about mental health and the burden of um perinatal mental disorder. So it wasn't difficult for us to get him involved as the PI when you know when we had this new project so i think we have that going for us because we already had um, some form of working relationship before this project started and because of that was really invested and the time it wasn't available the the other person that in the community health that became the coordinator for the state they worked together so most of the time when he couldn't come she was the one that attended the meeting so i think that was one of the things that we had going for us we already had a working relationship with them and then they already had been involved in earlier work that we had been doing. So I think that that really made them invested in this. Thank you. I think that points to sort of a long-term relationship building and that just going in and starting 
with with policymakers who've never worked with you before. What I'm hearing, Bibi, is that it can be challenging. I'd like to direct that same question to the WHO team. Uh, obviously, um, WHO goes in and works with policymakers under the banner of the prestige and uh, of WHO. But is there um, are there any um, experiences that that you can share, near to perhaps your colleagues in country, um, about about the the nature of that collaboration and how one works with um, government stakeholders? Thanks, Simon. Um, no, really interesting discussion. Can I direct the question to our regional advisor, Chido, and then invite the country uh, uh, participants to respond? Can we unmute Chido? <laughs> um, I'm wondering if Chido is struggling to unmute. Uh, yes, Catherine. Chido, you should be able to speak now. Sorry about that. Thank you. Go ahead, Chido, if you can. You should be able to speak. Chido, please unmute. Perhaps, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, perhaps. Uh, as uh, Chido uh, is uh, just getting on, um, I work with uh, Dr. Chido. I'm um, also in the WHO Regional Office for Africa. Um, <laughs> um, so the, I think this is certainly a very important question about how to engage, but also just make sure that policymakers are part of uh, the process for integration of perinatal mental health into the uh, maternal and child health services. And... Um, some of the things that were found very helpful is, of course, to bring all these uh, uh, different players in the health sector first together so that they can begin to work together. But then at a higher level is also to bring another level of uh, all the other stakeholders across the sectors. Because we know, uh, especially in terms of facilitating uh, activities at health facilities, we have partners who support uh, health facilities. So it's important that we establish a kind of coordination mechanism, uh, both within uh, health programs, but also across sectors. And then we use those platforms to bring a high level policymakers so that uh, whatever tools we develop get integrated into the healthcare system. So these, these are some of the approaches which we know are quite uh, helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we will take Chido's response. Um, if, if you want to add anything to that, Chido, before we go on to the next uh, speaker for this morning. We have one more question online. If you want, if Chido is not able, uh, maybe we can. Um... We don't really have time. Don't yeah. Okay. Well, we have we have another Q and A uh, at, at the end of that. Those yeah. Questions. Yeah. 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 Peter, are you able to, are you wanting to add anything at this point? Hi, everyone. My apologies. I think the, I wasn't connected as a panelist, uh, but thank you for the opportunity. And thank you to my colleagues. Uh, my colleague, Julius, uh, had already started answering. Um, but I think I agree with him that there does need to be um, multi-stakeholder interaction. I think one of the challenges we have in terms of um, coordination is silos. So many people are doing many things in, um, in different sectors, but not necessarily speaking to each other. So uh, platforms like this one and um, some of the work that has been done in country where uh, there is that interaction between um, uh, different players so that there's no duplication uh, of, of what the work that is being done. Um, and there's also uh, meaningful use of the available resources. Uh, I think that's my my comment on it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chido. Um, we hope to have um, more time for questions after the next presentations, two presentations. But I'd just like to to move straight into those due to time. I'm very very delighted that Antenne has, um, Asetha has come all the way from Belgium 
He is a health systems researcher with expertise and interest in global health, particularly implementation research aimed at preventing preventable morbidity and mortality in low resource settings. He completed his master's in public health at Addis Ababa University and his PhD um, at the University of Melbourne. His PhD research involved implementation research to promote respectful maternity care in Ethiopia. He's currently a PI of a project examining the link between disrespect and abuse during childbirth in health facilities and the link to postpartum depression. He exploring health systems capacity to improve respectful maternity care and uh, maternal mental health services in urban settings, both in Ethiopia and in Guinea. So we have, um, we're very lucky to have you join us. Thank you. Thanks, Simona, for uh, the kind introduction. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, as uh, Simona said, uh, I am jumping from a uh, kind of uh, very well organized and embedded research on obstetric violence or respectful maternity care and trying to delve deeper into how it is uh, linked with uh, poor perinatal mental health, mainly postpartum depression. So that is how uh, we start this journey back in uh, 2021. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of uh, the um, uh, MISPOD study. MISPOD is an acronym for mistreatment, which is also like obstetric violence or disrespect and abuse, and code is uh, postpartum depression. Then uh, walk you through uh, main findings and try to reflect on policy implementation and other practical uh, considerations in, in integrating both respectful maternity care and uh, perinatal mental health in uh, resource limited urban uh, settings in. Africa. Uh, instead of walking you through this uh, textual thing, I think let me just uh, jump to the uh, uh, framework. Um, as you can see over uh, the left side there, uh, there are several uh, determinants of poor perinatal mental illness, mainly uh, depression. But one uh, missing point here is how mistreatment uh, involves in the, in the process, in mistreatment during childbirth in health facilities. We know that many women in Africa experience verbal abuse, uh, sexual abuse, even um, an unconsented care and uh, discrimination, sometimes also detention in health facilities uh, at the time of birth in uh, health facilities. But the missing uh, link is how mistreatment plays in the uh, like a causal pathway of, of postpartum depression, because there are growing reports of uh, high levels of postpartum depression among women who report uh, mistreatment during facility-based childbirth. So um, there were a couple of studies which tried to retrospectively assess the link between the two. But the way we approach this issue is to try to uh, longitudinally enroll women and follow them from the third trimester of pregnancy till six to 10 weeks postpartum. So in Ethiopia and in Guinea, we recruited women during the third trimester of pregnancy. And we measured all those uh, uh, determinants and then their experiences. And we followed the same women until six to 10 weeks and measured again mistreatment and uh, postpartum depression. So this would allow us to have a better estimate of the potential role of mistreatment in, in uh, postpartum depression. In addition to that, we also tried to explore our health system constraints to the promotion of both uh, respectful maternity care and uh, uh, perinatal mental health using uh, the theoretical uh, perspective of uh, uh, complex and ad adaptive health systems. Uh, that is uh, where my expertise really lies. Uh, I am kind of inert here in this uh, uh, room because I don't have really that very strong clinical uh, knowledge of uh, mental health conditions. And we also uh, uh, tried to explore the lived experience of women who experience depression. So. We surveyed them during pregnancy, during the postpartum period. For example, in Ethiopia, we had 78 women, and in Guinea, 105 women who had a depression score of more than 11, uh, based on the EDPS scale. And then we uh, invited 25 women from each country uh, to, to, to also try to explain, and uh, sorry, exp ex explore uh, their lived experience, which was really quite challenging. But I am going to say a bit uh, more on that. <clears throat> So this table uh, uh, presents like uh, the, the, the key, uh, key, key uh, numbers. For example, in Ethiopia, we had uh, 442 women who were uh, surveyed during pregnancy. We were able to uh, 
uh, only um, get 373 of them during the postpartum period. So the first survey was facility based, but the second survey was either at home or at their preferred places because we are asking them very sensitive questions, including uh, spousal violence. So it, 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 it really depends on how they choose. And then for this, we had a, a good support system, including uh, providing them with a transportation allowance or for someone to go to their places and look after their babies, et cetera, so that we can have very uh, rich information. In Guinea, we uh, managed to uh, get a 338 of uh, 417 women who were surveyed during the uh, antipartum period. So in Ethiopia, we have completed all uh, qualitative aspects, but in Guinea, this is still in progress. We hope to finalize this in, in, in July. And all uh, research assistants who were involved in data collection were uh, female uh, research assistants, uh, mainly uh, medical doctors, uh, uh, midwives, and nurses. So uh, we measured all those uh, variables. Uh, I hope you all know uh, these issues because they are pertinent to uh, uh, yeah, perinatal depression. But the only thing I would like to say here is uh, we took a cutoff point of 11 or, 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 or more to say a woman has a symptom suggestive of uh, uh, antipartum or uh, postpartum uh, depression. We measured the mistreatment during facility-based childbirth using 32 indicators, which were previously uh, field tested in, in sub-Saharan African settings, including in Ethiopia and in, in uh, Guinea. So, uh, as you can see over there, uh, the uh, prevalence of antipartum depression in, in, uh, in Ethiopia was 15.6, uh, and in Guinea, it was uh, 34.5. By the way, this is the first study in Guinea to research uh, both uh, antipartum depression and postpartum depression. We couldn't find a single paper on uh, perinatal depression to even have like how the, the, the problem is like in Guinea. That is why we chose Guinea to, to also uh, have a kind of like a cross uh, cultural and contextual uh, settings in, in French speaking, West African setting and in a highly decentralized system with, with a relatively better primary health care system, which is uh, in, in, in Ethiopia. And postpartum depression was uh, still higher than 31% uh, in, in Guinea, and in Ethiopia it was uh, almost 21%. Uh, and mistreatment, as you can see, almost everyone experiences mistreatment in, in, in uh, both countries. Uh, intimate partner violence during pregnancy, we asked them, like in the past 12 months, have you experienced any of uh, these problems? For example, physical violence, emotional violence, and sexual violence. And in the postpartum period, we asked them intimate partner violence since a childbirth, since childbirth, uh, which, is, which is still uh, very high, and higher in, in Guinea than in Europe. Uh, so after taking into all those uh, potential uh, variables, including confounders, uh, mistreatment was uh, associated with uh, postpartum depression, even accounting for uh, depression which existed before childbirth, which is like antipartum depression. That is why we um, measured antipartum uh, depression in the third trimester of pregnancy to kind of minimize depression which might have really existed before a, a pregnancy to, to exclude, sorry. And one very important thing here is intimate partner violence experience is also associated with uh, disrespect and abuse. In, in health facilities. So you see there is a kind of a gender and a power dynamics. Those women who are vulnerable to intimate partner violence were also vulnerable to mistreatment. And then this tells us uh, like the need for uh, applying gender transformative and uh, intersectional approaches to really understand this is problem which we are uh, working on. Uh, going to the health systems part, uh, we tried to uh, identify contributors to um, poor integration of uh, uh, perinatal mental illness. By the way, like uh, we knew that this is a problem, but the issue is what are the, 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 the factors? So we posited uh, maternal uh, health and perinatal uh, mental health in a complex and adaptive maternal and bigger health system. Because it is a system which is open to internal and external stimuli and which adapted itself to uh, various uh, um, uh, contexts. As you can see, over uh, the left corner over there, we have uh, 
micro level uh, health facility uh, related issues and then uh, meso level issues are uh, subsidy or, or uh, uh, kind of like subsidy in, in Ethiopian context is Then in, from the complexity approach, then when we suggest this type of intervention, what would be its own like positive or negative impact from the perspective of complexity? So that is how we have to really look into uh, the, the, the cross connections and intersectionality of all uh, those issues. But in Ethiopia, we could say uh, it, it is nowhere. It is nowhere. So. This is a quote. I, we have several quotes, by the way, but for the like time, <laughs> for, for the same like practical arrangements and time, I, I am limiting uh, like my presentation to only this quote. So providers are kind of complaining also. They have mental uh, like issues. They are struggling to their fight. But at the same time, we are asking them to, to promote women. It is, it's, it's not a prerequisite, but they also say like they are also suffering from this problem. They must also be. Uh, included in the in the discourse and in the in the uh, discussion. So as a way forward, uh, we have to approach uh, perinatal mental health from uh, people-centered and women-centered uh, approaches, and we have to also embed formative research to understand this because we have to build a health system which is uh, going to be trusted by by both uh, like women communities and then their partners. For example, when we asked, okay. We found that you have a depression score of like 11 or more. Would you like to have psychosocial support? No, 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 no I don't want to go to that, that clinic because there is a social stigma and discrimination uh, uh, to that. We can also approach this from a bottom-up and top-down uh, health system uh, strengthening. And then uh, we really need uh, cutting edge implementation research to test, uh, to, to uh, design, and to, to scale up uh, innovative uh, PMH interventions. Yeah. So these are uh, like our collaborators, and also I, I am thankful to the uh, funders of the study, the Research Foundation Flanders, and the Institute of Tropical Medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you very much. Certainly, a lot of complexity there, <laughs> and intersectionality. We we can speak about that a bit um, after our next two speakers. Um, Chimaima, I have a message that the mic is off. Is it on now? Um, Keisha, who's online, if you could just confirm with me if the sound is now better. And if um, well, I could have the next speakers come forward um, and if you could just prepare the presentation for them. Um, and I'll introduce them to you. Um, we've got a shared presentation um, between um, uh, Musa Krubali and Katie Rose San Filippo, um, good friends of mine and collaborators. Um, thank you for coming all the way from London this morning. <laughs> uh, Musa is a clinic, a senior clinical research nurse at Bath's Health NHS Trust, and also the chairperson of the charity Gambia Healthcare Matters UK. He has an MPH from City University of London and a Bachelor of Science in Adult Nursing from University of Essex. He's also a trained journalist um, and former columnist for the now defunct Gambia Daily Observer newspaper. So a man of uh, too many talents um, <laughs> and um, he is going to be sharing with us um, the next presentation. Um, we have K Dr. Katie Rose uh, Mahon San Filippo, who is a present 
Presidential Research Fellow at um, SHPS. Yes, yeah, Health and Psychological Sciences. Yes. Health Sciences. A Health Sciences, a member of the Center for Healthcare Innovation Research at City University of London. Her current research is investigating how community and arts-based approaches, particularly music, and interventions can be scaled up, spread, and sustained more equitably in the UK and globally, with a focus on resource-constrained settings. And um, Katie Rose has extensive experience working in the Gambia and now in South Africa as well. So I look forward to hearing their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Simon, for that introduction. Um, good morning, all. Um, so over the years, so over the years, many different interventions have been developed and implemented to support perinatal mental health in low and middle income countries. However, most have either not been sustained, scaled up, or effectively spread. Why is that? This may be due to a limit in available learning from programs being implemented in a non-study environment and the problematic translation of interventions into scalable and sustainable programs in MICs. There is no study which has explored what strategies are necessary to effectively scale up spread and sustain complex perinatal mental health intervention in MICs. Therefore, to tackle this, we conducted a scoping review to explore the scope, extent, and nature of research or literature, what approaches or strategies have been considered, and what are some of the gaps in our understanding of strategies and approaches. For our scoping review, we use definition of scales and scale spread and sustainability laid out by the Port Blue and colleagues. In their paper, they define scale as the ambition or process of expanding coverage of health interventions. And spread was defined as the process through which new working methods developed in one setting are adopted, perhaps with appropriate modification in other organizational contexts. We searched the electronic databases and found free literature from websites of organizations that focus on maternal mental health. We looked at literature from as far as 2010 until November 2023. So two reviewers independently screened all information sources and two reviewers independently extracted data from the ex included information sources. Any discrepancies we found were resolved through discussion with a third independent reviewer. Through this process, we identified 40 information sources of which 32 were identified through database cited and eight through gray literature site and citation review. The majority of the studies focus on countries in Asia at 38%, with Pakistan being the most common study of focus. This was followed by settings in Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, I will... Thank you very much. This was followed by setting in Sub-Saharan Africa at 33%. Low middle income countries in general at 20%. Europe and Central Asia at 5%. And Latin America and the Caribbean at 5%. Most of the identified sources which were 33%, we are published in 2023, showing an increase of interest in this work, as you can see. I will now hand over to Kate Rose um, to talk about our findings. So thanks, Musa. So once we had our 40 uh, information sources, uh, we did a thematic synthesis, and um, we uh, divided these into main themes. And today I'm going to talk about them as scale strategies, spread uh, strategies, and sustainability strategies. 
Um, so there were three main themes that came out uh, from our information sources that describe scale strategies, some of which you've heard today. Um, so the first was diversifying the workforce. And this theme really includes strategies to support um, scale and increase capacity through training others beyond mental health specialists to deliver complex interventions. And as discussed today, a lot of these are termed task sharing or task shifting. And um, one example of this type of intervention, which has already been mentioned today, is the Thinking Healthy program, um, which is aimed to reduce perinatal depression through the adaptation and integration of cognitive behavioral therapy into routine work of community health workers. And actually, this program has now been adapted to be delivered in um, many different contexts, as well as by peers, as a way to uh, support further scale. The second theme is integration. So this includes strategies where the intervention is integrated into another care pathway. And we've again heard about this today. So that could be primary care, maternal and child health, which we talked about earlier, as well as community models of care. Um, and one of these um, <coughs> examples uh, is where basically is stepped care approach. And this is where the provision of less resource intense evidence-based interventions are given to the majority of people, where the more um, resource heavy uh, interventions are provided to those with greater need. And one example of that is the perinatal mental health project which Shimon will talk about um, later. So that's one talking about integration to maternal and child health. And then the final theme under scale strategies um, was tool or method development. Um, and these were usually talked about in sort of the more recent publications. Um, so one of these themes was around sort of the development of tech or digital solutions, as well as some papers talked about uh, development of implementation tools or using implementation methods as a way to support scale. Um, one example uh, from our papers was by Green and colleagues in 2020, where they um, used an AI tool um, to deliver an adapted version of the Thinking Healthy program. So they used an existing AI tool called Zuri in Kenya to engage patients through the use of a chat bot. So as a way to sort of extend the reach of the program. Um, I will say that these types of strategies were the most discussed in the information sources that we found um, with diversifying workforce and integration being the most discussed themes across all information sources. Um, and then more, it was really in the more recent information sources where implementation sign methods were directly discussed. So now when we look at spread strategies, we found that adaptation uh, was really the only one discussed. Can people still hear me? Is that yeah. fine? Okay. Um, I think somebody's gone out to ask them to desist. <laughs> I'll try and I'll try and speak it up. <laughs> But try to speak as loud as I can. Um, yeah, you can bellow though. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll speak Sorry. up. Um, so we looked at spread strategies and actually found that adaptation uh, was really one of the only ones discussed, uh, which we sort of categorized as a spread strategy. However, I will say that the word spread or the term spread was not used in any of the information sources that were found. And they described various adaptation methods, which are listed here. Um, and actually, a lot of these methods are participatory methods, which were discussed as very essential, thanks, <laughs> essential in adaptation processes, as well as being helpful not only for spread, but as well as for scale and sustainability. So, and when they talk about um, adaptation, they talk about um, them being adapted to a new context, uh, to a new population, or for a new condition. Very few information sources talk explicitly about sustainability strategies. Um, and when discussing sustainability strategies, it was really around sort of training, support, and supervision was one of the main themes that was discussed. And this theme discusses strategies around training and support for those that are facilitating the interventions, especially those that are not mental health specialists. Um, and one example of this is the cascade model um, which was developed by Antique and colleagues in, in 2017. And uh, this was to help support the sustainability of the Thinking Healthy program delivered by peers in Pakistan and India. 
And in this model, this there was a specialist sort of master trainer who trained and supervised a group of non-specialist trainers who then in turn provided training and supervision for peers. So a train the trainer model or cascade model. And uh, they uh, described, sorry, they explained that this was a way in which to support the sustainability of the thinking puppy program. Um, they also talk about voltage drop, uh, which we've talked about earlier. So they talked about how good training and supervision um, was uh, helpful in avoiding voltage drop, which is where the intervention loses some degree of its potency or fidelity when it's sort of translated from a research context into the real world. And they also talked about training a support, training and support as helping with program drift. Um, which is where the intervention deviates from its manualized or implementation protocols. So this type of training and support and supervision was discussed um, around those concepts. And then the second theme and last theme I'll discuss today was around stakeholder engagement, which again, we've heard a lot about today about the importance of stakeholder engagement. And that includes with policymakers, with people with lived experience, healthcare workers and community groups. And that a lot of the papers or the information sources that we found talked about this as being incredibly essential for ensuring the sustainability of programs. Um, they also talked about how policy engagement can help with fundraising as well as redirecting available funding resources um, and also help with the incorporation of mental health into sort of mainstream health agendas. So those are some of the main themes that came out of our information sources. So just to sum up, I tried to give some examples very quickly of some strategies that have been used across all the information sources that we identified. Um, we described the themes here and, and in our hopefully come, uh, upcoming paper as sort of discrete. However, these strategies are very interconnected and interrelated. And in fact, when we think about these strategies used together, uh, they work to support embedding innovation, which is how innovations are successfully implemented at scale. And actually many of the information sources describe more than one strategy being used simultaneously. So I think some of the takeaways here is that we need to think about these strategies and how they might be applicable to the work that you're doing. It's important to use various strategies simultaneously and also to begin about some of these, begin thinking about some of these strategies from the beginning stages of intervention development. That's it. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and what's with space for uh, this being a paper? Yes. 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 <laughs> We're busy drafting that paper. So thank you very much. Um, under superb leadership. We don't have a lot of time for questions. Hi, Tolo. Welcome. <laughs> um, does anybody um, want to uh, ask a question? Hi, Kileni. <laughs> Anyone want to ask a question from the audience? Um, thanks. Still, go ahead and speak in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Estelle Sibre. I'm a senior researcher at the, okay, at the African Population and Health Research Center. Um, I think we made a question, I think, for the last presenter, but also for WHO. Uh, as you can see, only policy study in terms of implementation research for me it's really like because we really like in evidence within the continent what what are the plans especially from the WHO perspective we're talking a lot about piloting we, we heard about Mozambique Kenya and Tanzania but uh, what are some of those plans are we thinking of of also implementing examples exemplars a bit like the family planning ones uh, for mental maternal mental health in Africa so from the WHO perspective, what are really some of those plans that they have in mind? Uh, also thinking of sustainability. Thanks. Thank you. I'm wondering if there are any of the WHO team who's still online who would like to answer Estelle's question about future plans. Uh, I know that many of the colleagues from WHO needed to move, move on. Um, yeah, I'm afraid Nina um, has her apologies to have to go. Okay, but okay. I, I am part of a working group where we're looking at um, developing toolkits and um, implementation, uh, really practical sets of tools and implementation so that the guide that was published um, at the end of 2022 um, will now have an associated 
how to pack with options. So I think that's that's in the in the works over the next year. Um, and so there will be a supplementary approach where countries can then take these tools, adapt them, choose from options, and then implement. Um, so that is that is the strategy as far as I know in terms of the toolkit development. Um, but um, there will be um, emails that you can you can ask the, the colleagues directly. Um, do we ha we have an online? We're going to be alternating in person online just for parity's sake and ho hope to get to some more. Yeah, Thank we you. Have a question from Carabo Mokoena. Carabo. To ask you to unmute, please. Go ahead, Carabo. Hi, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Carabo Mokoena. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Perfect. Hi. Okay, fantastic. I'm a mental health advocate um, in South Africa. I'm a mother of two, and I'm I'm personally passionate about uh, maternal mental health because I, for one, had a major depressive episode after the birth of my second one because it was a post-miscarriage pregnancy. So I've really dedicated my online space, which is a community that I've built. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's a space for that. I can see you guys are doing incredible work from an academic point of view and policy. And I'm wondering if there's a place and a role for a digital online advocates and how we can play a role in amplifying your work and also kind of raising awareness with mothers that are interacting with um, digital um, content. I think that's my question. Do any of the speakers want to, are you directing that to any speaker, Karabo, in particular? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm directing that to anyone. Um, do any of the speakers want to to respond? How we bring in the advocates, Musa, as a as a journalist and communicator. I think that's a bit of a response. Okay. Um, I think that something came out of um, the work that we did was the importance of sort of participatory methods, which definitely ensure that people with such experience and advocates like yourself become quite central. Um, to a lot of the work that we do. So I think in terms of really being able to develop innovations that are um, relevant and helpful and then can be spread and implemented, um, that type of collaboration with people like yourself is going to be essential. Thank you. Um, thanks, Karabo. I think um, there is huge space um, to bring in advocates like yourself um, I think we have one of our other conveners, um, also from South Africa, who can perhaps talk to, are you going to be talking to this question? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Then I think um, we have the next question, um, Karina, thank you. Thank Hi, you. Karina Longba, Head of Women's Reproductive Health here in Oxford. Um, I, I, I've been really... Um, well, inspired and, and also, you know, shocked by some of the statistics that we've all heard here this morning and, and the, the great presentations about what's happening in the implementation sphere. My question is very general. Um, I mean, a lot of the studies we've heard about is about how to tackle the problem as it arises, as it happens. I wondered what was happening in the sphere of education of sort of younger girls and boys at sort of school level. You know, we've talked about stigma, we've talked about, you know, um, um, you know, attitude and respect for each other, etc. Um, I wonder if any of the studies are also um, sort of moving into sort of the younger age groups and actually, um, yes, you know, educating girls and boys, um, you know, about, about perinatal health, essentially, uh, and the importance of that. Um, is there anybody from the from the group who would like to respond to that question? Anybody with expertise or experience in the matter? Krina, I think this is a this is an under under researched field. It's it's um it's a field with um I, I, but however I think there is definitely a move and a trend in um, perinatal mental health work. It's it's a new one to go into preconception work and to, into prevention work. But I think it's in its embryonic stage, to use a pun, yeah. uh, pre-embryonic stage. Um, uh, and um, people, I think there are very few examples of people working in school systems with youth 
but it is emerging. Is, is this a response to that question? Thanks. If you just start speaking and we'll get the um we'll get the camp the, the mic to you. Thanks. Thanks. Can you speak up? Government and Health Economics at the University of Amsterdam. So um, I don't know about any interventions or, or programs that look at perinatal mental health in schools, but there is a lot going on in terms of um, gender attitudes and sexual education in schools, trying to change gender norms. And I think that's where it should start, mm. right? because a lot of what we've heard today is also related to uh, gender inequities, gender-based violence, and, and norms about how to treat women or not. So, Working with young children, young adolescents and teenagers about that, I think would be the first step. Um, even before going into really the specific referring mental health. Um, yeah. Thank you. Is there a question online? Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe we can get so Tatiana had her hand raised and she had a comment and she I know she's also working on some of the issues and with WHO. So um Tatiana, I'm gonna um, unmute you or ask you to unmute if you could please. Go ahead, Tatiana, with your question. Okay, great. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So I think just to add on to what Simone had discussed about what is happening in terms of further support in implementation. So um, yes, in addition to the implementation toolkit that's currently being worked on by WHO, what the WHO country offices, the regional office in Africa and headquarters has been doing, has been working specifically within Kenya, Mozambique and Tanzania to bring together different stakeholders, including policymakers. I know that was alluded to beforehand um, in a way to identify ways and to develop care pathways that can exist with existing practices um, and strengthen those resources to think about ways in which to integrate uh, screening for mental health services um, and need, and also to determine what can be provided within facility and what needs to happen outside as a referral and where those referrals will happen. Um, so I've just come back last week, uh, we were in Tanzania at one of these meetings and we talked about kind of differences between um, mainland Tanzania and also um, in Zanzibar and even within those two contexts within Zanzibar the differences in terms of who you would refer to uh, and what's happening um, within those communities. So really thinking about and tailoring to what is happening in each setting I think is the, the important bit and what we'll learn from the activities in these three countries will inform that wider implementation toolkit which will be much more generalized um, and enable countries outside of those three to be able to adapt for those uses. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you. I mean, it's clearly going to be an iterative process and we'll learn from these pilot countries. Thanks, Tatiana. I know we have more questions. I think that's testimony to the, the conversation that has to continue. We've got Tina until quarter two. We're going to be having a break. I'm sorry we can't take those two questions. Please bring them up in the tea breaks and later if we can. Um, Ashley, did you want to say something? Thank you. It's fine that you're uh, during the tea break signing into registration. I'll have a sheet ready for you. There'll be registration for tea at tea. If you don't have time, you can do it at lunchtime as well. And um, please enjoy it in the room next door. We'll be back. We aim to be back at quarter two. So sadly, it's only 15 minutes to fit in more um for more program. Thank you very much.